welcome. My name is Ryan Keenan, and I'm the director of product at deeplearning.ai. We really appreciate you taking some time out to join us for this event. We've got people all over the world joining us right now. Uh, so what we want to talk about today is that the field of artificial intelligence has seen incredible developments in recent years. The performance of machine learning models and the relative accessibility of powerful computers means that nowadays, almost anyone with a little bit of coding skills and access to the internet can piece together a really powerful implementation of at least some sort of proof of concept solution, ranging from things like computer vision to natural language processing and much more. That said, the gap between any proof of concept solution that you might put together and a production ready machine learning system is really a substantial gap. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Machine learning operations, or MLOps for short, is an emerging field within the AI space focused on closing that proof of concept to production gap. Uh, the field of MLOps brings together the fields of machine learning, so data and modeling pipelines, uh, with the field of modern software engineering, so things for like from DevOps to deployment. Uh, so today, we have with us a panel of MLOps experts to discuss what are the most important aspects of production machine learning and what MLOps looks like at companies today, from industry giants like Google um, to small startups. We organized this panel to celebrate the launch of the third course in our new specialization titled Machine Learning Engineering for Production and MLOps. Uh, we've created this set of courses to help learners gain practical knowledge and skills in this exciting new field. Uh, you can learn more about the Machine Learning Engineering for Production and MLOps specialization at our website, deeplearning.ai, or by following the link in the description below. On the specialization landing page, you can also find a link to our discourse community where you can connect with other learners and mentors and where we'll be hosting an AMA session soon with one of the course instructors. So with that, I'd like to welcome our panelists for today's discussion. Uh, we have with us Rajat Monga, co-founder of a stealth startup and former lead at TensorFlow at Google. We also have Chip Hoyan, adjunct lecturer at Stanford University. We have Robert Crow, TensorFlow developer engineer at Google and one of the instructors of our specialization. Lawrence Maroney, uh, who's an AI advocacy lead at Google, also one of the instructors of this and other specializations at uh, deeplearning.ai. And our very own Andrew Ung, founder of uh, deeplearning.ai. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this event today. And so for the next 40 minutes or so, I'll be asking some questions to our panelists. And uh, while I'll be directing my questions to a specific person among you, I'd like to encourage you all to jump in and offer your input on the conversation. We'd like to make it a free flowing uh, discussion. So we'll start off by just a little bit more introduction from each of our panelists. Um, so let's begin with you, Rajat. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, your thoughts on MLOps to get us started? Yeah, definitely. So uh, as you mentioned, Ryan, I spent a long time at Google, most recently, you know, helping build TensorFlow and then run it for a long time. It's great to see you, Lawrence and Robert. I guess we, we spent a long time together. Um, it, since, you know, over the last year or so, I left Google to, and I'm working on a startup that I'll reveal in a short while. Uh, but going back to the topic of MLOps, something that you know I spent a long time with with TensorFlow and otherwise, uh, you know the way I look at it is some things that you alluded to, Ryan, where we've had this modeling where you're building a proof of concept. You want to see that oh, is it going to add value to whatever you're trying to do? Perhaps you see okay, yay, it's giving you some predictions. They seem valuable. Now, how do I use it? So going from that point all the way to using this model in an application, every bit that you need is part of MLOps, I would say. Uh, there are obviously lots of different things that we go into today, but just at a high level, that's where I want to be. Thanks very much, Rajat. Uh, Chip, let's uh, hear a little bit more from you in the form of introduction and a thoughts on MLOps. Hey, uh, so my name is Chip. 
um, uh, I'm teaching machine learning system design at Stanford, and I'm also part of a very small team that is building infrastructure for real-time machine learning, so as in um, online predictions and continual learning. Um, previously, I was helping, um, so, so my, my background in Tum ML Ops is actually starting uh, from the first ML course was I took with Andrew Ng. I was, so he was like the reason why I got stuck in all of this. No, not stuck, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good word. Um, so I'm, I'm extremely, I'm a bit nervous right now because like everyone here is like have been looking up for a long time. So I'm just like very excited and a bit nervous as well. Um, so I started um, in a more research background and then I did more when to apply research at an NVIDIA, where we build tools um, for company to experiment with a new models. But then I, re I realized that, oh, I think the problems, of course, there's a lot of problem with doing research, but then so like a lot of smart people working on it. And I think that's an under addressed problem is with like how to bring these models into, into productions. So that's why I started joining a startup uh, like Snorkel to work on it. And then now I'm focusing on entirely on like how to like, um, so, so I believe that like training is a small part of the problem. The problem is the retraining. Like once you have the model out there and how do you keep on like updating it to because like, you know, have heard of things like data drift, concept drift, like the models, performance degrees in real life. Then how do you address that problem? So that's what I'm focusing on. So I think it's part of ML Ops as well, yeah. Absolutely, thanks, Chip. Uh, Robert, um, could we get a little introduction from you? Hi, I'm, I'm Robert Crow. I'm a, a TensorFlow developer engineer at Google and work with Lawrence and, and used to work with Rajat. Um, and uh, so ML Ops, um, first of all, I'm not crazy about the term ML Ops. Um, and there's a lot of disagreement. You, you talk to a lot of different people, everybody has a different uh, definition of what it is, but um, essentially for me, it's it's the idea of taking a model and really creating a product or service out of it, and all the issues that, that come up when you try to do that, like drift, as, as Chip, Chip mentioned, the, the problem of getting labeled data, not just for your first data set, but for continuing data sets as you retrain your model, things like privacy and fairness and, and serving different customer sets, you know, well, things like resource optimization, all that stuff comes up in a production ML setting that you don't have when you're doing, you know, research or, or academia or, or what have you. So for me, that's the focus of ML ops is, is making it possible to create and sustain a product or service responsibly. Thanks, Robert. And thanks for getting us started with the debate because I hope, I hope we can have more debate uh, about just what this field is and, and what the most important pieces are. Uh, but Lawrence, yeah, well, let me- uh, a disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Lawrence, let me give you, uh, you a moment to introduce yourself and disagree with Robert. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm Lawrence. I, uh, I lead the AI advocacy here at Google and I'm actually really excited about the fact that we're having these conversations now. And we're having these conversations to try and figure out what exactly it is we mean by model ops or ML ops, or is it a, is it a function of DevOps or, or what, it, what exactly is it? Because if you just think back just a couple of years, um, all of our focus was like, how do we build a model? You know, how do we hyperparameter tune? How do we, you know, what type of algorithm should we choose? What type of model in, like architecture or neural architecture should we be working with? But now the conversations we're having is like, well, how do we use this effectively in production? How do we think about things like the serving infrastructure? scaling, process management, and all that kind of thing. So that just, to me, by the fact that we're having these conversations now shows that as an industry, we're taking great strides forward in bringing ML and bringing AI, you know, to the to the general populace and, and, the, and to the general application developer. And um, whether it's a branch of DevOps or whether it's something in and of itself, I think is the kind of thing that we'll discover as we're going along on this journey. So, you know, it's just great that we're doing this now. Great, yeah, glad to be here. Um, well, Andrew, yeah. I'll put it over to you to wrap up our introductions. Well, you know, it, it, listening to, to, to everyone's comments, I was reminded when um, I was once leading a speech recognition team and the engineers, the machine learning engineers and speech recognition team uh, had a great result, you know, uh, very accurate speech on the test set, uh, even better than human level performance. So they went to the business product owners and said, look at this great speech system we've built, you know, I don't know, give me a raise, celebrate my accomplishments. And the business product owner said, well, we tested it. It doesn't work. This sucks. Look at all these users mistranscribing horrible transcriptions. And then my machine learning team said, no, we did well on the test set. You know, therefore, <laughs> logically, 
it must work. And, and, and it was difficult to move the conversation forward. I think over the last decade, um, thanks to the rise of deep learning and other things, uh, we collectively have become much better than before at doing well in the holdout test set, which is fantastic, celebrate that. Uh, uh, and I think that if you want all of you watching this, if you want your fantastic machine learning work to make it into valuable production systems as well, I think ML Ops is this nascent field. They're all trying to you know, invent collectively that I think will help everyone through the entire life cycle of machine learning project from you know, scoping to collecting and managing the data to training the model and improving the data, uh, improving the model to then deployment, monitoring, co managing concept-driven, data-driven model maintenance. So I think uh, MLOps is this exciting nascent discipline solving that entire life cycle of machine learning project. And what, one thing I'm excited about this is uh, you know, when, when, when I teach on, right, teach online on Deep Learned I and Coursera, a lot of things, you know, we teach are well tried true concepts that that's widely agreed on. I think ML Ops uh, and machine learning production, it is very much on the cutting edge. So, so I find that exciting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Well, that gets us started or off in the right direction where, where we wanted to begin with this uh, discussion of ML Ops in the first place is there is debate. There is uh, so MLOps is, is short for machine learning operations, or as Lawrence mentioned, sometimes you could see it as model operations, but that seems to be something differentiated. But anyhow, MLOps is really a nascent field. And so it seems like it would be worth talking a bit more about just what this field is and, and perhaps having some debate and disagreement over what it is, but also to what extent do the roles, the current roles of data scientists or ML engineer involve ML ops. Um, so we'll go around the room here. And uh, Robert, since you kicked us off in the debate, I'll, I'll give you the, the first say on, on what, it all, what it all is. What it all means. Um, well, <laughs> so one thing I try to emphasize when I'm trying to explain, uh, I like the term production ML. When I'm trying to explain that to people is, is the fact that the world changes. And your model, when it's trained, is a snapshot in time of what the world was when you collected your training data. And depending on what field you're in, that could be fine for maybe quite a while. But just like human beings, if, if you don't adapt to change, you don't do as well and, and things change around you and you're not prepared to deal with it. It's the same thing with a model. And in some domains, uh, markets are a good example. You, you're, if you're trying to use a model to, to make any sort of market prediction, markets change you know, within hours. So that means your model needs to learn to adapt to those changes. And that usually means collecting new labeled data and retraining your model. So understanding that and the whole, uh, the, the domain, uh, oop, look like we lost everybody. Um, the domain knowledge around that is, is uh, incredibly important. Are we still on? We're, so, we're still on, I think okay. we had a little blip there, but. Um, Thanks, Robert. Uh, Rajat, let's uh, let's hear from you. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that makes a lot of sense what you said, Robert, around data is not static. What we're doing is not static. So the models, which are a representation of the data, do have to change as the data is changing, as the market or the world around us is changing. Uh, so so that's sort of a you know partly a data centric view. Let me give you our. You know, provide a different, soft, more software-centric view in some sense. If you think about models, they're also just functions. Traditionally, with software, we've hard-coded those functions. You know, used to be heuristics or whatever is being replaced with predictive models today. Now, instead of writing that software and hard-coding it, saying this is what it is, and you know, obviously that's going to be a lot harder to change or learn or, or fix. We, we're saying, okay, let's just learn that function from the data and use that instead. Uh, now, if you take that software-centric view a bit, then this is just a function in your overall program that you're building. And suddenly you start to see, oh, if you were to think of, you know, not to mix it with DevOps, but there are a lot of things that we can learn from there. If you think of all the software engineering principles that you've thought of that we just don't have in ML yet, uh, I think there's room to really learn a lot from there and take that here and apply that. Of course, that's not the end of it. I don't think we can just apply those blindly exactly for the reasons what you said, Robert, which is uh, this, this function is not static. It has to change over time. For certain kinds of things where you, know, you have static images, you just want to identify flowers. 
yeah, we're not going to get too many new species of flowers in the next year or two. Uh, but on the other hand, in a business where you're relying on customer data or anything like that, things change all the time and you want those models to be updated all the time. Absolutely. Thanks, Rajat. Uh, Chip, I'd like to get your perspective on this. So, yeah, I think this is a very interesting inter interesting discussion. Um, so I think I agree a lot with what Robert and Rajat has said. So I think what I, what I'm, what I heard from both is that, um, yeah, ML ops is like peculiar because um, machine learning is not just code. Like you, you can't just like finish a code and do a lot of testing in, um, in, in depth and then you deploy it and then the DevOps will take care of it as they can monitor like system performance uptime and all the classic um, DevOps metrics. But like a machine learning model is like part code and part data and data changes in, in real time. So 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 maybe like we don't have like a, a new uh, type of flower to predict, but like there are a lot of uh, problems when I have new classes all the time. So for like I was working with an e-commerce company, right? And, and they want to be a problem to categorize their product and I have new live product out on the time and it's like it's changing that like from like um every uh, once every week or every week it's like but like can be like a few times a day so so like it's, it's very 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 challenge a challenging problem and you can't just like hand the models to DevOps people and then it's like hopes that like things turn out to be the best for, for the best but they also um you want to model not just like the system metrics but you also want to model how the uh, model is doing because every time the data environment changes, the model performance changes. So like uh, now the DevOps people can have to like, monitor on studies and like data. Uh, we, we mentioned that already, like data's um, uh, like concept drift and stuff. So so like DevOps people may not be like, equipped to do it. And now we have to bring in like machine learning uh, people to like do deal with like things in production and maybe machine learning people are not like equipped to, to handle all the DevOps tools. So now we have like multiple teams from different um, domain experts to like try to work on the same workflow. So how do we like help them like uh, talk to each other and communicate effectively because everyone has different lingo and have different expertise. So it's a DevOps ML option so about like bringing people from different disciplines, different um, uh, yeah, discipline should like work together to solve like a common problem. Thanks, Chip. Yeah, so you're you're mentioning something that seems like it's core in people's minds when they're thinking about this. If if they're, you know, maybe they were thinking about wanting to be a data scientist or wanting to be a machine learning engineer, and and then how does that tie in with this whole this whole world of ML ops? Um, Lawrence, I'd like to get your perspective, and also, you know, what what does it mean for someone who's on a team and and how they actually interact with uh, the whole pipeline. Yeah, so I think one of the things that I'd just like to highlight was something I think Rajat was saying, and it's uh, to me, the one of the more exciting things about ML and being able to use ML in production is that you design your systems fundamentally differently than you would on older based production systems, which were entirely code based. And in particular, that gives you the opportunity by being data driven to give you a um, Sorry, is, is my audio working okay? I just saw a message pop up. It's a little rough, yeah, but um, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so anyway, just, so what, I, uh, what I was just saying is that the um, by having ML-based systems, what we can do is um, frequently update our models, frequently update our functionality in ways that would be much more difficult to do in traditional software-based systems. So with that ability to do frequent updates, then we can serve our customers better. And then that gives feature engineers, that gives ML engineers um, different workflows for how they can, like I say, serve their customers better. And we have one motto at Google is that if you focus on the user, all else will follow. And the, being able to do ML ops in, in um, sorry, being able to do ML in production and then having an ML ops system behind that so that you can focus on your user, that gives you new opportunities and new skill sets for your ML engineers and others to follow. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lawrence. Um, and, and Andrew, I'd I'm like going to rejoin. Go Sorry. <laughs> sure. No problem. Um, Andrew, I'd like to get your perspective on all this. Yeah, no, great, 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 great for everyone. I, I, I want to add one, one additional observation to the perspective, um, which is uh, 
the importance of entering the data and a lack of tools for doing that systematically. Uh, so for example, Chip mentioned working on e-com. One e-com problem I was chatting with friends about the other day was um, how do you decide whether to label products as you know, hazardous or dangerous, right? So I have a two-year-old daughter, so you know, I don't know. Uh, she's inventing new ways to kill herself every day. I'm just gonna not let her kill herself. But so, you know, so, so and, and it turns out that when you get people to um, label products that you buy on an e-com site, is this hazardous for children? There actually isn't universal agreement. It's actually really difficult to judge what is hazardous and what isn't. And so I think that um, one thing I see in machine learning is previously we used to have, you know, people like us or like any of you watching this hack around the data set for six months or nine months and maybe we'll kind of figure out a way to label it. Or maybe you throw up our hands and say, you know what, I don't know what's has this. Let's just get three people or five people to label everything and take an average and kind of hope for the best. And I think those processes, maybe they work if you have a giant living farm or something, but yet even that doesn't work that well. And um, I feel like uh, if, if, if uh, the, the nascent ML ops teams can help with data preparation as well, in terms of deciding what data do you want to collect? Do I need more products in this category labeled or that category? What are the standards for labeling the data? Um, I think that there is a big gap today in tools to engineer the data so that when you feed it to the code, you get the performance that you want. And I think that is important in addition to the training and the model of data iteration, as well as the post-deployment, your know, monitoring and maintenance. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, so now we have some of the data-centric perspective, some of the software-centric perspective, and, and some other ideas uh, from everyone. I'd like to, to take a moment then to think about what does this actually look like in practice? So you've all worked at um, a variety of different places, and I can only imagine that this uh, MLOps pipeline or MLOps infrastructure looks quite different at a place like Google than it would look at some um, small startup. So, Maybe first, I think it'd be really interesting for people to hear a little bit about just what does MLOps look like today at Google? Uh, well, let's start with you, Lawrence. Okay, and hopefully you're hearing me okay now. Um, so I think one of the things that how it would look like at Google is it, the easy answer is it depends. So in many ways, because MLOps is such a nascent thing that um, there are so many different options for you to be able to design an MLOps based system that it really depends on the system that you're actually building. So one of the things that we uh, want to kind of look at when at Google is to say, okay, we have this little box, which is our ML code, but one of the things at Google is how do we scale that? Uh, how do we make sure that you know, we can focus on billions of users instead of thousands of users? And so a lot of the serving infrastructure that has to be in place for scaling is, you know, this similar type of skills that traditional ops folks would have. Uh, then it comes to monitoring. Uh, of course, it's very, very important for us to make sure that our systems are up, you know, we have whatever it is, five digits, six digits uptime. So to be able to build a decent monitoring infrastructure to make sure that our models are running inference um, at the required parameters, at the required speed, those types of things. So it's, you know, we, we do want to have a good monitoring infrastructure in place. But because there's so many of these different dependencies, serving infrastructure, monitoring, scalability, process management, machine resource management, data verification, one of the important things is that there's so many people and there's so many moving parts to be able to keep all of these uh, working together that we want to make sure that we have flexibility between these. We have standards-based interfaces between these. We have open systems as much as possible between these, and we generally design our infrastructures that way. And out of all of that then came TFX. Um, so a lot of the things that we've learned about building systems for ML ops, you know, we really focus into TFX. And I know Robert's the real expert in that far more than I, so. Uh, maybe I'll hand over to him here. Um, well, thanks, Lawrence. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I mean, I'm thinking about the small companies that I've I've worked in, and 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 how to contrast that against Google. Part of the situation at Google is historical because we were doing large scale ML really before tools were available in the outside world. So we invented a lot of things like TensorFlow, and before that, disbelief in order to accomplish the, you know, the goals that, that the business had. And there's still a lot of very powerful, but very bespoke tools that are used in our MLOps infrastructure within Google. Um, and gradually we're, we're taking those and moving them into open source. Things like uh, Kubernetes, for example, really came out of the framework that was 
originally developed inside Google to, to manage containerized applications. Or as, as, as Lawrence said, well, both TensorFlow and, and TFX came out of you know, that work that was done because of an internal need. And I see this a lot at different companies where they've, because they needed something and they couldn't pull something off the shelf, they've invented it. And it's caused a lot of problems for a lot of people because it's now something they have to maintain. So they're really anxious to try to adopt industry-wide, uh, you know, available things that, that are supported by communities, things like TensorFlow and, and TFX, that helps them with their burden and it moves things forward as a community and not just, you know, their little team. So um, I don't know, did I answer the question? I was kind of rambling there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that gives some interesting perspective. Um, it, and. So people are inventing tools to solve their own problems because oftentimes the tools don't all exist. Um, Rajat, you're you're at a small uh, stealth startup. At the, I'm assuming it's small, uh, but uh, you know, are you inventing your own tools? What does it look like there? Uh, so so yes and no. Uh, you know, having seen the Google side of things and seen the craziness that ensues when you try to build everything from scratch. No, I don't want to build things from scratch. Where possible. Uh, that, that said, you know, it, having been, you know, really involved with TensorFlow and thinking about where it's going and how it helps people and with TensorFlow Extended, uh, clearly want to leverage what's out there. And there's a lot of value in being able to use these uh, standardized tools where we can. So, uh, you know, as we grow, I think we'll use more of those. Where we are starting out, though, the, you know, what I'm a firm believer in is uh, really get that end-to-end -end thing working and then try to improve those. So, so what does that mean? Uh, for us, the first thing was, okay, let's prove it out. Let's build a model. That's what you, know, you need to do before you can build a pipeline around it. Of course, even to build a model, we had to do a bunch of data processing and stuff. It wasn't like we could get to the model without doing the data processing and getting things in order. Uh, but to, to start with, each of those was more bespoke. You know, The data processing was, okay, a custom handwritten thing because we had a small data set that we could just process and that was fine. Then we had to start scaling it out. We had to run it across multiple machines. Now, what do we just scale it out using say Kubernetes that came up here? Do we use Spark? You know, those are the kind of things that come up and how do you then, uh, once you have the model and now you want to deploy it, how do you start to put those together? As we are picking each of these pieces, uh, of course, for each piece individually, we want to use as much of the standards stuff as we can. Uh, being in the long run, I think being able to use something like TensorFlow Extended is the right way for us to go uh, connect it with the right kind of, you know, uh, orchestration systems, perhaps like Airflow or whatever, so we can run, run all of these and uh, make all of that work. But to start with for a startup, I don't think it's necessarily the right thing to pick all the pieces together and, and start with the, the biggest thing. You want to pick and choose, add things as you go along, but try not to build those from scratch. There is a lot of stuff out there today that you can leverage. And at our end, we are definitely doing a lot of that. Thanks, Rob. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, I, I, I want to say something that may, that may simultaneously annoy both Robert and Lauren. So we'll, we'll see. But uh, Robert mentioned um, uh, disbelief. Uh, uh, and 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 then TFX and and frankly I I remember right way back working with Rajat uh, and Jeff Dean and others on disbelief and candidly you know I certainly made a ton of terrible decisions right you can blame me for all the bad decisions made back then give Rajat and and Jeff credit for all the good decisions but but I think that. Uh, you know, I mean, it was too CPU centric where these giant crazy C++ linear algebra matrix multiplication things trying to implement distributed CPUs, there's lots of bad ideas you blame me for. Um, and, and, and then later, Rajat, you know, led the development of TensorFlow uh, and, and that, that, that kind of mixed version was much better. I think even though TFX is still the, uh, the shiny thing today, part of me wonders if we're in the disbelief uh, uh, sorry, disbelief was a precursor to, to, to TensorFlow. But part of me wonders if, um, uh, collectively, you know, even TFX, which is say the art, is the disbelief of, of, of deep learning 10 years ago, where it's say the art is the best thing out there, but there's something even much better to be invented. Um, late last night, I was starting a Google Doc where I was writing down, like, a, frankly, a bunch of research ideas to share with one of my friends on new ideas to how to engineer the data, because I was struggling literally yesterday afternoon 
I was looking at some flavor, uh, some label image data. The labels are junky, but there are about 5,000 images. It was you know, really hassleful to just browse and figure out what's going on and relabel the data. So I was annoyed. So last night I was thinking, okay, maybe you can develop a learning algorithm to make this much better. So I wrote up a Google Doc with three ideas to share with one of my friends, ask him, he hasn't gotten back to me yet. If, if, so, so I feel like we're in this, there's so much stuff to be invented. Um, again, 10 years ago, when we shifted collectively, the community shifted the world to, uh, 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 to deep learning. I did not understand at that time how many tens of thousands of novel inventions and research papers and so on would be needed. And then, you know, there came Disbelief and TensorFlow and, and other frameworks that laid the foundation. I think today, as we think about ML ops and data centric AI, I think there are easily some tens of thousands of ideas to be invented and new frameworks. And I think, and actually, and I know, right, Chip's been busy out inventing these. As well as some of our mutual friends like Chris Ray, Alex Ratner, you know, there's a lot, lot of people are just nibbling at this. I think it'll be a big movement. Yeah, I think that's a great um, segue actually. Chip, I wanted to hear more from you on, but before Stanford, you were at Snorkel, which is of course um, a tool for some of these uh, ML ops, uh, data pipeline stuff uh, that, that might be part of some of this collection of tools that people are using for, for what they're doing at their company. Uh, you've also written a post that, um, that, that captures what are all the tools out there, what are some of the trends. Um, I'd really love to get your perspective on, on some of these things. Is, are, the, are the tools really out there now or is, is much of it yet to be invented? Where, where do you think things are? Um, so I think that before um, we get there, I just want you to take a step back. Um, so, so I think the requirement for tools right now uh, actually depends a lot on the company size, so use case, and also the maturity. So I think I tend to think of like ML ops. Um, adoptions based on two axes. One is from like the size of company and I very small, like small startup, like Agile, and then have like two large company. And I think like uh, the adoption is like, look like something like this. So it's very big company like uh, Google, Netflix, Alibaba. Uh, they, they like have incredible in infrastructure engineers. They build incredible tools and they move very fast and they have state of the art ML ops tool. And they have like the smallest startup and who like um, very, very agile and they like, um, eager to, to adopt new tools. But there are like a lot of companies in the middle who are like very interested, but then like they are boggled down by uh, either the lack of like really good engineers because also really good engineers like to join like Google and stuff, I don't know, like, and, and then like they even sort of boggled down by legacy systems. So like they want to update. Uh, first of all, a lot of companies like want to like switch to like do real-time machine learning, but they like are boggled down by all the, all the system is set up to do like batch jobs. Like they can't really easily switch to like streaming. So like a uh, legacy system is one thing. Um, and, and then like, they have like m adoption maturity, like so, like the longer the company has been like uh, adopting machine learning, like they, um, the um, uh, the more effect effective they are, and they can um, and the more sophisticated. So so in the beginning, like, you just want to go from like no machine learning to machine learning. So they just want to have some tools to have you get there. But then like once you have a lot of things in production, you you kind of want to like. Um, make the most out of it. So you worry about retuning monitoring and like uh, squeeze out like the last drop of performance. So like, and this company require different tools. So, so yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I like totally like off track here and like taking on different time, but, but yeah, so, um, um, so, um, so yeah, the tools depend on it. And um, I think, I think for the, um, because of like so many wide requirements, it's really hard to have a standard uh, pipeline for every company that works. But I do hope that in the next like uh, five years or something, like when everyone has been at the same maturity level, then we can have more standardized uh, pipeline. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on that also because you're teaching this stuff at Stanford. So um, when, you're, when you're telling students uh, about how to think of all this, um, and also in the article, you point out that while modeling and achieving the best accuracy with your model was kind of the bread and butter of research in academia some years ago, it's evolved to um, more interest within research regarding ML ops or ML infrastructure. Could you say more about that? And what do you, what do you tell your students? So this is like, uh, 
actually when it was teaching the course it's uh, very hard to come up with what you teach the student it's not that like they are not things you teach it's just like uh, so so currently a lot of our ops is very tool focused right they have a pipeline so like oh yeah you started like using this tool for modeling this tool for monitoring this tool for uh, bringing to productions right but like, the problem with tools that tools like evolve over time like um that like, you have like new packages coming out all the time you have a new version coming out all the time you want to teach student tools like their knowledge like what you teach and be outdated like as soon as at uh, the, the new tools update. So actually I learned that lesson because the first course I taught was TensorFlow. And the first version was in TensorFlow 1.0. It's like one of these like uh, graph base, right? And then you switch like Raja, I blame you, like you switch into like 2.0 and like you go execution. It was like, oh my God, I need to update like half of my materials. And it's like, it's just so much work. So so I want to try to like teach more on like, uh, on like best practice, like on the more philosoph philosophical level. But then students it's like, oh, you can't, you can't really learn how to do ML ops by just like looking at philosophy like always like best tense principles so it's like it's very hard to strike the, the right balance um and it's of course it's still evolving so i think it's also might be a challenge for for students or like engineers trying to get into like ml ops ml productions is just like you don't want to like just learn about tools uh, but you also don't want to just learn at a high level either so i'm just very curious to see the course that ML, ml ops uh, specializations uh by course uh, by by deep learning to see uh how you guys like try the right balance yeah, I, I think that um, it was definitely something that, that took uh, some evolution along the way. Um, but but also, you started the you sort of started us thinking about apart from courses or apart from theory, what is it that people should be doing if they're trying to prepare for this field? I think a lot of people watching today are are thinking they'd like to prepare themselves to be um, a good candidate for a role in in the, the sort of ML ops world. Uh, Rajat, could you uh, could you extend that uh, thought yeah. a little bit? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I think uh, I mean, Chip had some really great points there on uh, you know how to think about it and stuff. But one of the things that she said was, you know, it's hard to teach and learn at a philosophical level saying, okay, this is how things should be in general. Uh, that's great, but how do I apply it? How do I think about it in practice and stuff? Uh, and again, coming from a more software centric view, my perspective there has always been, okay, if we have ways of, we believe that this is the right way to do, let's say data labeling, or this is the right way to build models, or this is the right way to deploying models. Can we build software to simplify that? And that's where the tools comes, that's where TensorFlow came, that's where TensorFlow Extended came and all of that. How do we codify that so it's easier for the next person where they just don't read a set of principles that here are three things to read and do. You actually have software to do those, you know, and yes, it's none of this is static. Things change over time. TensorFlow went from version one, which had certain things to version two, which evolved and learned from that and applied a whole bunch of new things as well. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, at some point we'll see TensorFlow three or something new as well. And totally, we should continue to iterate and live, live with that. But at the same time, for people to be able to leverage this and uh, be able to do more ML, I think they need good solid tools. If I, you know, going again, compare, comparing to software where we were, like where we've evolved over the last 40 years, clearly ML, it hasn't been around that long. I mean, ML in, as a field has been around that long, but not as being deployed in products and stuff. So there's a long way for us to go to really catch up to a lot of those and learn from that. Absolutely. And so Robert, you're, uh, you're uh, the instructor for much of the machine learning engineering and production and ML ops specialization that we're uh, putting out the third course of today. Um, Lawrence, you're also one of our instructors. Uh, you, you two um, have some perspectives as well on if people are taking these courses, what else should they be doing? Um, Lawrence, what, what are your thoughts? It looked like you were about to say something. Yeah, sure. Um, hopefully you can see and hear me now and I followed some good ops principles and I had a backup ready. <laughs> uh, so, um, I think one of the things that's uh, really interesting, and uh, just going back to stuff that Andrew and Chip and Rajat said, um, is that, you know, it's something like TFX, it's at version 1.0 now, and we're dealing with 1.0 stuff. And if we think back to other technologies, uh, anybody remember Windows 1.0 or Java 1.0, and, lo and look how far they came. And, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we can look back and laugh at how naive they seem to be. Uh, back then, but we needed to get through that to get to be where we are today. And I think, you know, in the ML ops space and the, in the uh, model ops space, and we're at 1.0 uh, with a lot of these products. And um, so to 
to understand what it is that we need to learn, we also have to understand that many of the things that we're learning, many of the concepts that we're learning now, we may be throwing away in 18 months, we may be throwing away in two years as we're rapidly iterating towards, you know, version 2.0 and 3.0 and 4.0 of, of MLOps systems. So I think, you know, that's it, to me, that's why I'm particularly excited that, you know, uh, Deep Learning AI, Google, we're all working together to be able to create courses like this, that Chip is doing the stuff that she's doing at Stanford, because um, we need to get a, like a critical mass of people with these skills in place so that we can learn from our mistakes, we can learn what's working, we can learn what's not working, we can see the opportunities out there that you know, startups and other people in the industry are gonna be able to take and run with to be able to build an improved system for everybody. And uh, so I think, you know, it's a, it's, it's a particularly exciting time to be working on this stuff. It's like, like I said, if those of us who are in the industry, when Java 1.0 came out or when Windows 1.0 came out, look how much we've grown. And I would love like five years from now, 10 years from now to be looking back and saying like with ML ops and model ops, it's like, look how much we've grown. Yeah, I think it's not like any of us here regret it, right? Learning things on deep learning or TensorFlow one when when it was immature. I think people should learn TFX, uh, and then it'll get better, and then we'll all evolve with the tools. Yeah, the, the more people using it, the more requirements are going to be driven, right? And then the the better we'll be able to build whatever product, not just TFX, but anything. Yeah, I I very much agree with that. The one of the differences for TFX is that. It's been used so heavily inside Google for so long that it is a lot more bulletproof than, and, and really well thought out than, than, uh, than a lot of, you know, something coming from a, a, you know, a different company that is just brand new. So there's, so there's that going on. But to get back to the original question, what, what should they be learning if they want to be in ML ops? Um, it's, it's a difficult skill set and it's a rare skill set. You, you, you really need to understand both the ML side and the software engineering side to be really effective. And those people are hard to find. I, I can tell you, I've tried to hire, and usually you have one or the other. You have people, especially coming from like a mathematical or statistics background, who have you know very strong theoretical understanding of ML, and you know maybe know something like R or or Python well enough to put models together, but in a you know in a production setting is very difficult for them to create production level code and systems. So um, it's, it's tough, you, you kind of need both sides of things and it's, you know, it's a lot. And I feel like there are, there are no jobs in, there are very few jobs in ML ops right now. You won't see that in a job description, but don't let that fool you. Lots of companies are trying to hire people. They know how to build and deploy machine learning systems. So job interviews will ask, have you ever deployed a machine learning system? That's basically an ML ops question, even though the word ML ops doesn't appear in the job description. So I think this is a important skill, very useful skill for people to be learning today. I know Chip just uh, open sourced her book on like uh, ML interviews and all that kind of thing. I'd love to know, have you had any experience or have you seen anything while researching that book around the type of skills people are looking for in ML ops or model ops? Um, so, so I think it really depends on, on like different company size and also like where they are in their adoptions or maturity. Um, so, so I think what, what I'm trying to get my student um, to, um, to practice is just like, like don't focus too much on techniques or tools. I like don't like just go after like the latest buzzwords. Like try to like solve, like try to be like problem focused. So like what is the problem you're trying to solve? And I just try like, to find like, whatever you can to like solve that problem. So so like um, instead of looking at, hey, what's the latest um, terms or tools in ML, ML ops? It's like, why don't you just try to do a, a project? Like try to deploy a, a, mo a simple model on the phone. And like, in the process of doing that, they suddenly realize so many problems. And also like there's so many tools that like um, at least I or like most a lot of my students can't appreciate until they have run into the problems that require those tools. So so yeah, so I think um, uh, I would keep encouraging my students. And so like people who read my my books and in interviews, just like just try to like do a lot of uh, projects. Like try to get involved. I know that like the, the project you do um, in the in the personal project gonna be very small and might not as a scale require for a lot of companies. But that's where you have to start. And then you try to get involved more. Um, I get the internships uh, with, with companies when we allow you to like try try it out at like at a, at a different scale. 
You know, I, I, I think what, 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 what Chip alluded to a couple of times, I think is actually a very interesting point. I find that ML ops practices are quite different based on the scale of the data set and maybe company size. So I remember I once you know, built a face detection and recognition system with over 300 million images that use a certain set of processes. Whereas at uh, Landing AI, which is working on an ML ops platform for computer vision, you know, we often work with hundreds of images. And so the tools and techniques are very different. Uh, the other gulf is structured versus unstructured data. With structured data, you can get humans, excuse me, unstructured data, like images and audio, you get humans examine it, label it. Whereas for tablet data or structured data, you know, human judgment on it. It's hard to look at a list of transactions and figure out what the person was really intending when they did whatever. So I find that, that these gaps, uh, big, big, big differences in practices. So, yeah. These days, just because of my work at Landing AI, I spent a lot of time trying to think how to innovate ML ops for computer vision and how to you know, help all of us collectively build and deploy computer vision systems 10 times faster. But I think there's actually a huge space and a very large family of techniques to be invented still. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, I wanna make sure that we spend a little time getting to questions that have come in from the audience. And uh, so what we'll do now is shift to answering individual questions and what I'll do is uh, ask for one person to give a perspective and a, and a brief answer, and then we'll move on to the next one, just so that we can try to get to some number of, of questions. Uh, first off, we wanna start with a couple questions from uh, learners who are in the current uh, set of courses from Deep Learning AI, the Machine Learning Engineering for Production and MLOP Specialization. Uh, and so the first question we have is from Pablo Drummond. Uh, the question is about experiment tracking, and he says, I understood that the MLOps pipeline needs to be data-centric, not model-centric, but when it comes to the experiment tracking, like models that might not have been deployed, uh, do we really need an application or framework? Uh, don't you think that we need to address this requirement as an MLOps, a part of the MLOps infrastructure? Um, does somebody want to take that one? I, mean, I, I can try a little bit with a bit of experience that I've had with these things. And um, primarily in my case, it was with building models for use in mobile. Uh, so to deploy them to an Android or an iOS device. And um, we have an infrastructure at Google, a product, sorry, I hope this doesn't sound like a product pitch, uh, called Firebase. And uh, one of the really nice things that we were able to do with Firebase was deploy multiple models based on different data sets or based on different neural architectures, and then have like an A-B testing infrastructure that would say, hey, this cohort gets this model, this cohort gets this model, this cohort gets this one, and then tie that with analytics so that we could see the model performance you know, based on, you know, different cohorts, how, how they did with the model, did they get better inferences, did they get faster inferences and those kind of things. So my only experience in like in that space is really doing it like that. And I found that it was a really, really powerful way of really getting feedback from multiple users so that we could fine tune uh, models so that we could fine tune the like the neural architecture used in the model, the data sets that we use in the model and those kind of things. So, you know, as well as data centric ML ops, we could also have model centric ML ops like that with, you know, a smart way of deploying models to different users. Sorry, Andrew, I think you were going to say something. Uh, yeah, I, I, no, thank, thank, thanks. So much. And thank, thank you, Pablo, uh, uh, for the question. So I think, you know, uh, I, I, some, some of us have this experience where we run experiment, finally it does well in the test set. And then we talk to, you know, our colleague that had worked on it and said, thanks for sending me that data set. Where did you get this data set from? And he goes, oh yes, it's on my laptop. And then he says, oh yes, but I built that data set because my other friend had emailed the data set and is on their laptop. And where's their laptop? Oh shoot, my laptop got stolen or accidentally through the file. And so if this great result that's completely not replicable you know, ever again. Uh, so I find that, and, and I remember when I used to do experiment tracking, you know, I would use Vim to edit a text file on my desktop, right? So that was local to me. And then we upgraded to doing experiment tracking by filling in rows of a Google spreadsheet, which could at least be shared. But then I'd forget some detail, I'd forget to fill the learning rate in some column of spreadsheet and it became non-replicable again. Or we end up going back to redo the hyperparameter search to figure out what exactly did we do to get this result. So I feel like, um, in principle, experiment tracking can be done in a, in a manual way, but um, I think that I, I do think uh, that with tools for experiment tracking, we should keep track of the model as well as the data, as well as the data lineage and provenance. How on earth did all the data go through all this stuff to result in the model? Then that actually makes it more uh, possible to figure out how we got a model and then also how to improve it. 
Thanks, Andrew. And and uh, we have we have another question from someone. Um, this is from Shahroz Aslam. In uh, in the first course, uh, this is this is something you mentioned earlier, Andrew. But uh, there's there's a discussion of kind of what is the agreement or compromise between the machine learning engineer and the business owner regarding the goals of an ML deployment. Um, so for example, test set accuracy versus revenue. Uh, so the question is how, uh, how, how should we educate as I'm, I'm assuming that Chef Rose is coming from the perspective of the machine learning engineer, how should we educate industrial management regarding the machine learning cycle um, and how to uh, tell them that, you know, the resources that they're very uh, motivated to invest in might not give them the results they're, they're looking for. Uh, Rajat, you've you've uh, perhaps been a part of some of these conversations. I'd love to get your uh, perspective on that. Uh, de definitely. So so uh, today, actually, I'm on both sides of the conversation. In that, uh, in the startup, I'm putting on lots of hats. Some of that does include the ML engineering hat, and where oh, can we get the best model possible? Or uh, you know, even the data scientist hat in that sense, right? To at the end of the day, we care about the product that the customer is going to see what does it mean for them? And so, so that's like, if I think about the business perspective, that, that's the perspective, okay, whatever we are doing, doesn't matter if it's a model, doesn't matter what, if we're writing software, how does it help the business? How does it help our customers, our end users themselves? Uh, so, you know, I, again, going back to, you know, how to think about it from an ML engineer perspective, I, I think it's important to really think of that end to end. Can you get the whole thing working? Not just say for the example that Andrew said, oh, the speech data set, this, you know, I have this amazing results on the speech data set. I've seen way too many of those, you know, uh, perhaps even hundred percent accuracy because we are overfitting on that data set, of course. Uh, but you go to the real world and it's it's not real anymore because um, in that product for what the user actually cares about, that, that's not working. So, uh, you know, again, what's important is get to the most basic thing that you can do as an ML engineer first, make sure it's having an impact at the end of the day, make sure it's changing somebody's life at the end of the day, and then keep improving it. Then you'll see that works for both the folks. And that's the thing that the ML engineer needs to learn. And from the business perspective, they need to learn that, you know what, initially you might see only a small win, but it's worth investing because long-term, this is where you're going to get. It might be a you know, sort of a local improvement or whatever local minimize we might say, but if we keep investing, we'll keep improving things there. I think in any business, there's always a tension between the business decision maker and the technical decision maker. And uh, with ML and with ML ops in particular, um, the, I think the business decision maker has a pretty tough job because there's a lot of belief out there that you know AI will fix every problem and ML models can fix every problem and that kind of thing. And you know they, they have so much pressure on them to say, well, let's transform our business using AI. And um, so then it's the job of the ML engineer, I think in this case, also to manage their expectations about what is possible, what isn't possible. And, you know, to, to have that good conversation with each other so that you could understand what the, the external business requirements and customer requirements are and see how it is that you can drive that and build a roadmap to be able to drive something there, but also to, to push back on the expectations that, you know, AI or ML is some kind of magic pixie dust that will fix everything and create a, you know, create a new business. And, you know, and, and, and it's in the tension in those conversations that we can actually really learn new things and we can really, you know, drive, drive any business forward. Absolutely. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, all right. We'll, we'll turn to some questions that have come in on the Slido platform where we're collecting questions and people are able to upvote them. Uh, the, the most upvoted question is from Jerry Bai. And uh, the question starts out by saying, uh, machine learning engineering is much more than just algorithms and models, something that we've been talking about throughout this discussion. Uh, what other sort of tech skills should one have to be considered a good machine learning engineer or MLOps practitioner, I'll add to that. Um, so is this like backend and backend software engineering or something else? Um, Robert, I think you alluded to this a little bit when you were first discussing your thoughts on, on um, production ML, MLOps, uh, what, it all, what it all means. Could you say more about that and answer uh, Jerry's question there? Well, so it's a mix of, of uh, software engineering and, and uh, infrastructure development and, and ML. But I think core to that really is an understanding of the whole ML life cycle and, and really, you know, understanding the different issues that are, 
are different when you you put something into production and offer it as a product or service. So things like, uh, you know, are you going to serve different parts of your data set? If, if those are people, are you going to serve different groups of people, you know, equally well? Uh, or do you even know how well you serve different groups of people? And that requires a deeper level of analysis of your, your model performance. Or where am I going to get labels for the next data set that I need to train my model next week? How do I generate those labels and how do I generate enough and what label quality and how much drift do I see? All, all those issues come, come forward. So it's, it's a multidisciplinary thing that, that uh, requires at, at its core an understanding of the data and the model and the life cycle. So I think the most important group of, of skills is around ML, but in order to actually implement all that stuff, you need exposure and some experience with, you know, the rest of the of the the uh, the deployment chain, really. Thanks, Robert. Uh, and and I think that one of the things that th this is a, that has been a question that's come up over and over. What are the the what's the total skill set that someone needs? And um, I'll just mention that that uh, one of our partner companies, Workera puts out an assessment that allows you to kind of see where you at, are at it with algorithmic uh, coding or software development or ML or all the different pieces. So it's kind of a nice tool to, to see where, um, where you might have some room to do some work. Uh, I'll, I'll, I wanna go to the next question here, which is from Vaidehi Rane. And this one, I think a lot of people are thinking about out there. Uh, it's, it says almost all job profiles require many years of work experience to become an MLOps engineer. Uh, so where should future MLOps engineers start their career? Uh, presumably you can't just start being an MLOps engineer or maybe that's not even a job title quite yet, but, um, but where, should, where should people think about starting? Uh, Chip, do you wanna take that one? So I think there's something that have been saying for a few years that people kind of hit me for, is that like, if you have to choose between machine learning and engineering, always choose engineering. So so I think that's, that's just one thing I've noticed when I was like interviewing candidates or like whatever we look for, is that like, people who, who know things that they know a lot of machine learning actually like um um so things that machine learning is a very new and very evolving and the people who are very confident in their machine knowledge tend to be the people who are most stuck in the old ways of doing things it's very hard for them to change what they consider as the expertise so whereas like people who are very um eager to learn a very good engineer because they're more problem focused so this is like so for them is they're not married to an certain technique or concept and it's a lot more like um easier for them to like adapt to new tools and like, learning new ways of doing things so that's what i really really look for is like really good engineers so it doesn't matter if they like um like if they don't know machine learning yes i can send them to andrew Young's course so they can learn for like uh three months or like take this specializations for for you know like for like maybe six more months but then like it's, it takes like years and years and years to train a really good engineer so yeah start by like being a good engineer <laughs> Thanks, Chip. Uh, the next question we have is uh, from Neil. And this question uh, says, MLOps tools come and go. Andrew, you were saying something about this just a moment ago. Uh, the tooling is always evolving. New tools need to be invented. Um, so the question is, what are some important principles of MLOps that will remain relevant five years down the road and are tool agnostic? Um, Andrew, do you want to add to what you said before and say something about that? Sure. Oh, um, I think I think someone earlier was it Chip said you know the principles of ML ops are not yet defined. There is no book that says these are ten things to keep in mind. I'd like to put forward one principle that I found useful, which is uh, when I stand up ML ops teams, when I set up ML ops teams, I usually ask the team to think through how you can uh, ensure consistently high quality data throughout the entire life cycle of a machine learning project. Um, this is just one principle I'm sure that others we discover, agree, invented or hopefully agreed on, but I find that when a team is able through the entire life cycle of a machine learning project from scoping to the initial data collection and definition to the training and how you improve the model when it doesn't work, what do you do? Where are you gonna fix the data to how you uh, deploy, monitor, maintain? I think that if you can have tools and principles and mindsets around how to ensure consistently high quality data through the entire project 
pressure life cycle, that usually solves a lot of problems. It's like the pressure would go at least two times faster, maybe maybe more than two times faster if you just solve that one thing. Very much more than two times, actually. I think in, in addition to that, um, that one thing that we can learn from DevOps is that when we have multiple systems to be able to deliver on a product and these multiple systems have to interact with each other, that we have some kind of standards-based interface in between them, uh, that we try to avoid as much proprietary type interfacing between them, between those because if a vendor goes away, if a product becomes obsolete or you know things along those lines that we can you know swap and replace easily. And you know, Andrew's exactly right that we got to get our data right. We got to get it right as it flows throughout the system, but it's, you know, the, it's those gaps in the system and where the data flows we just want to make sure that you know we don't take any undue dependencies there that we could lose or we could miss out on and you know that's just one of the one of the tenets of any kind of product design is to make sure that you're as open as possible there so that you don't you know uh, paint yourself into a corner architecturally yeah i'm with you and just say one of the challenges uh uh you know just be annoying is that um, the boundary conditions of machine learning systems are much fuzzier, right? Because yeah. we don't really know what is the valid space of input. It's quite hard to quantify. So, and 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 so uh, and, and so I feel like actually I was chatting about D. Scully uh, uh, the other day, who had written this in the well-known. Google paper from like five years ago on the high interest credit card debt of machine learning, where I think he articulated this. Oh, I, actually, D, D is also advising us on our data centric uh, uh, AI competition. So great for him for that. But I think um, we also need better tools to figure out what are the boundary conditions so that when we have the APIs, we know if the upstream thing has changed sufficiently that the downstream thing you know, needs to be maintained or updated. Just one thing to add to these, I, I think this is great. So, so one of the things that Andrew touched upon was what helps you go faster in this thing? And it's not just, oh, this software is faster, or this model is faster to deploy. It's more about that entire cycle. The understanding that you're not going through this cycle once, you will have to keep doing that, whether it's changing the data or changing the model, et cetera. So if you can make the entire cycle go faster and iterate more, it's the number of iterations that's going to decide how far you go, not how fast each iteration is or how good one specific iteration is. So you better get that right and get that flywheel going and that helps a lot. Yeah, I, I agree with that, absolutely. It's, it's you know, for me, the, the fundamental things are the data itself and there has to be a predictive signal in, in the data. Earlier when we talked about trying to explain to, to business stakeholders whether or not you were gonna be able to produce the result you know, they were looking for is often going to get back to how much predictive signal there is in the data. But it's not, again, it's not a one time thing. It's, it's a life. It's, it's throughout the life of that product or service. So you're going to be going back to that data and you've got to have automated systems and really well-defined processes to be able to maintain that. So it's, it's, uh, as far as what's, what are the fundamental principles that are going to stay constant as tooling and, and methodology evolves forward? That's not an easy question to answer, but I would say a focus on the data is and a focus on the life cycle is always probably going to be important. Thanks. Well, that I'm really glad to get all of your perspectives on that. Chip, did you want to add anything? We'll give you the closing remark before we, uh, before we wrap up the discussion and, and um, go on to the presentation from Robert. Yeah, thanks, thanks Ryan for the pressure. Um, so <laughs> I just want to like jump on what Raja just said. It's like iterate, iterate is is a key. So like also like what I think like uh, Robert and, and uh, Andrew and uh, Lawrence has said about. So you don't just like tune the model, put it out there, and be done with it. Like a lot of the time, be spending on like improving the model. You iterate not just on the model. Actually, like I have talked to like a few companies who have very successful deploy machine learning in productions. Like uh, I don't want to say the name, but like you can just like take like the biggest ten com. 10 names you can think of, but, but it's like, they, they actually stop iterating on the model. Like once you put the model into production, it's very hard to like update like to another architecture, but a lot easier to like just keep updating the, the data. So like iterate on data and then they iterate on labeling. So talk to a few companies, Andrew, Kapati, 
uh, Andre Cap, I think, was telling me this like they, they have a labeling team in house that should label data. And people were like, oh, why? Um, and and, and, and his HR team, HR person was like, why? Uh, how long do you need a labeling team for? And he was like, how long do you need the engineering team for? So it's just such an inherent part of the business that it's like, uh, so it definitely on, on the how he labels the data, a data infrastructure, uh, hardware. So a lot of it. So just iterate. Uh, just, yeah, I hope that is. Um, yeah, that is um, hopefully worthy of the closing remark. Absolutely, iterate, iterate, iterate. <laughs> uh, all right, well, I wish we had another hour to keep this discussion going. This has been fantastic. Uh, what we want to close with is uh, a little introduction to the third course of the specialization uh, from Robert. But first, I just want to thank everybody for the discussion. Uh, really fantastic uh, perspectives from all of you. So, so thanks so much for, for joining us. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to you, Robert. Okay, uh, I should be sharing my screen. I don't know if you guys can see it. Yep, looks good. Okay, so in five minutes, I'm gonna try to summarize five weeks of coursework <laughs> and we'll see how this goes. Um, the, the third course in, this, in the series focuses on uh, machine learning modeling pipelines in production and it's focused really on the learning or training part of things. So we don't really talk about deployment in this, in this particular course. Uh, there's other areas of the series that do. So um, I can get my slide to advance here. Um, yeah, let's do that. So we start in, in week one with neural architecture search uh, and go through things like understanding the search strategy and the performance estimation strategy and so forth. We look at ML or auto ML rather in, as in the large and how neural architecture search fits into that. We go through a, a real world example, looking at a, a company called Meredith Digital and their use of auto ML and what kind of uh, results they were able to obtain with that. We look and we actually are gonna do an exercise where we're gonna classify uh, images of clouds uh, with auto ML. And we do that on, a, on the Quick Labs platform for a lot of our exercises that require uh, a fairly extensive infrastructure and provisioning, Quick Labs uh, makes it easy for us to, to stand that up and, and use it in our exercises. Week two, we're looking at resource management and, and really understanding how we can optimize our use of resources because resource use is cost. And in businesses, that's incredibly important. So we look at uh, things like dimensionality and how it affects uh, the, uh, the uh, resources that are required and the performance of the models. So understanding how dimensionality affects the model and the search space, looking at uh, dimensionality reduction like PCA and so forth, looking at uh, uh, other approaches like quantization, especially in a mobile context or pruning where we're actually pruning uh, connections out of, the, out of the network. For uh, week three, we look at high performance modeling which uh, for a lot of uh, larger models these days can be incredibly important, but again, from a resource uh, optimization standpoint. So understanding data parallelism and model parallelism is very important for distributed training. Pipeline parallelism, especially for high-speed ingestion because we have expensive accelerators that we need to make sure that we're using, uh, that we're making maximum use of those. So we need to give them data uh, on, at a fairly high rate. Uh, things like knowledge distillation to, to, to try to improve our model uh, from a, uh, a more complex teacher to a simpler student and some of the results around that. For week four, we look at model analysis and not just at a top level, but at a deeper level. Because again, uh, when, we're, when we're working in a production environment, we have to be responsible. And we also want to serve all of our customers well or all of our users as well. So we look at some of the tooling. This is uh, TensorFlow model analysis that you can use to do really deep analysis of your model performance and not just top level uh, single number metrics. We also look at uh, some of the sensitivity analysis uh, and residual to using, uh, in this case, the what if tool, which allows us to do uh, really very uh, advanced uh, sensitivity analysis. And we look at some of the vulnerabilities to attacks as well, because uh, models are, are open to uh, attacks of different kinds. 
that can do things like pull, uh, you know, personally identifiable information from your model. So um, understanding how the model is monitored over time, this is get, gets back to the life cycle that we've we've mentioned several times, and monitoring your model when it's in, when it's been deployed is is important for that. So week five, we get to interpretability. Interpretability has several different sides to it, including understanding different kinds of interpretability, local or global, whether the model is intrinsically interpretable or if you try to interpret it post, post hoc. We look at uh, some of the more advanced uh, architectures for interpretability, including TensorFlow Lattice, which allows for a, a greater degree of inherent interpretability. Um, we look at Shapley values uh, in, in a couple of the tools around that. Shapley is a very well-established tool for understanding uh, and interpreting model results. Um, we look at uh, testing concept activation vectors, or TCAV, which is a, another uh, uh, way to, to evaluate model results and, and interpret uh, the, 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 uh, the performance of the model. So, in a nutshell, these are the five weeks, um, and those are the, the topics that we're covering. So how'd I do? Anybody, anybody time that? That was perfect, Robert. Five minutes. Uh, I, I'm so sorry that that had to go so fast. There's so much good stuff in there. Um, but <laughs> for those of you who want more detail on all of that, this is the third course that Robert just uh, walked through of the Machine Learning Engineering for Production and MLOps Specialization from deeplearning.ai. This is um, the, the first two courses launched about six weeks ago, and there will be a fourth course coming soon. Um, so thank you so much, Robert. And uh, thanks again to all of our panelists. It was really a pleasure to have this discussion. And uh, we uh, really hope to keep the discussion going in uh, future events or, or collaborations. Thanks, everyone.